Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Every week we bring you the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. Did you know that I make many of these stories I read available for download at thewelltoldtale.net? The longer stories that I split up into episodes for the podcast, all stitched together in one file. Like The Call of Cthulhu, for example, by the author of today's story, H.P. Lovecraft. The Colour Out of Space was H.P. Lovecraft's own personal favourite of his short stories, and the first he wrote to truly embody his own unique blend of science fiction and horror. It is a dark tale with gruesome images, but the greatest horror of all is not what can be seen and understood, but that which cannot, that which defies description and sends people to the edges of sanity. It's time to pull up a chair Relax and enjoy The Colour Out of Space by H.P. Lovecraft. West of Arkham, the hills rise wild, and there are valleys with deep woods that no axe has ever cut. There are dark, narrow glens where the trees slope fantastically, and where thin brooklets trickle without ever having caught the glint of sunlight. On the gentle slopes there are farms, ancient and rocky, with squat, moss-coated cottages brooding eternally over old New England secrets in the lee of great ledges. But these are all vacant now, the wide chimneys crumbling and the shingled sides bulging perilously beneath low gambrel roofs. The old folk have gone away, and foreigners do not like to live there. French Canadians have tried it, Italians have tried it, and the Poles have come and departed. It is not because of anything that can be seen or heard or handled, but because of something that is imagined. The place is not good for imagination, and does not bring restful dreams at night. It must be this which keeps the foreigners away, for old Amy Pierce has never told them of anything he recalls from the strange days. Amy whose head has been quite queer for years, is the only one who still remains, or whoever talks of the strange days. And he dares to do this because his house is so near the open fields and the travelled roads around Arkham. There once was a road over the hills and through the valleys that ran straight where the blasted heath is now, but people ceased to use it and a new road was laid, curving far towards the south. Traces of the old one can still be found amidst the weeds of a returning wilderness, and some of them will doubtless linger even when half the hollows are flooded for the new reservoir. Then the dark woods will be cut down, and the blasted heath will slumber far below blue waters, whose surface will mirror the sky and ripple in the sun. And the secrets of the strange days will be one with the deep's secrets, one with the hidden lore of old ocean, and all the mystery of primal earth. When I went into the hills and vales to survey for the new reservoir, they told me the place was evil. They told me this in Arkham, and because that is a very old town full of witch legends, I thought the evil must be something which grandams had whispered to children through the centuries. The name Blasted Heath seemed to me very odd and theatrical, and I wondered how it had come into the folklore of a Puritan people. Then I saw that dark westward tangle of glens and slopes for myself, and ceased to wonder at anything besides its own elder mystery. It was morning when I saw it, but shadow lurked always there. The trees grew too thickly, and their trunks were too big for any healthy New England wood, There was too much silence in the dim alleys between them, and the floor was too soft with the dank moss and mattings of infinite years of decay. In the open spaces, mostly along the line of the old road, there were little hillside farms, sometimes with all the buildings standing, sometimes with only one or two, and sometimes with only a lone chimney or fast-filling cellar. Weeds and briars reigned, and the furtive wild things rustled in the undergrowth. Upon everything was a haze of restlessness and oppression, a touch of the unreal and the grotesque, as if some vital element of perspective were awry. I did not wonder that the foreigners would not stay, for this was no region to sleep in. 
It was too much like a landscape of Salvatore Rosa, too much like some forbidden woodcut in a tale of terror. But even all this was not so bad as the blasted heath. I knew it the moment I came upon it, at the bottom of a spacious valley, for no other name could fit such a thing, or any other thing fit such a name. It was as if the poet had coined the phrase from having seen this one particular region. It must, I thought as I viewed it, be the outcome of a fire. But why had nothing new ever grown over these five acres of grey desolation that sprawled open to the sky like a great spot eaten by acid in the woods and fields? It lay largely to the north of the ancient road line, but encroached a little on the other side. I felt an odd reluctance about approaching, and did so at last only because my business took me through and past it. There was no vegetation of any kind on that broad expanse, but only a fine grey dust or ash which no wind seemed ever to blow about. The trees near it were sickly and stunted, and many dead trunks stood or lay rotting at the rim. As I walked hurriedly by, I saw the tumbled bricks and stones of an old chimney and a cellar on my right, and the yawning black moor of an abandoned well whose stagnant vapours played strange tricks with the hues of the sunlight. Even the long, dark woodland climb beyond seemed welcome in contrast, and I marvelled no more at the frightened whispers of the Arkham people. There had been no house or ruin near, even in the old days the place must have been lonely and remote. And at twilight, dreading to repass that ominous spot, I walked circuitously back to the town by the curious road on the south. I vaguely wished some clouds would gather, for an odd timidity about the deep skyey voids above had crept into my soul. In the evening, I asked old people in Arkham about the blasted heath, and what was meant by that phrase, strange days, which so many evasively muttered. I could not, however, get any good answers, except that all the mystery was much more recent than I had dreamed. It was not a matter of old legendary stuff at all, but something within the lifetime of those who spoke, it had happened in the 80s, and a family had disappeared or was killed. Speakers would not be exact, and because they all told me to pay no attention to old Amy Pierce's crazy tales, I sought him out the next morning, having heard that he lived alone in the ancient tottering cottage where the trees first began to get thick. It was a fearsomely ancient place, and had begun to exude the faint miasmal odour which clings about houses that have stood too long. Only with persistent knocking could I rouse the aged man, and when he shuffled timidly to the door, I could tell he was not glad to see me. He was not so feeble as I had expected, but his eyes drooped in a curious way, and his unkempt clothing and white beard made him seem very worn and dismal. Not knowing just how he could best be launched onto his tales, I feigned a matter of business, told him of my surveying, and asked vague questions about the district. He was far brighter and more educated than I had been led to think, and before I knew it had grasped quite as much of the subject as any man I had talked with in Arkham. He was not like other rustics I had known in the sections where the reservoirs were to be. From him there were no protests at the miles of old wood and farmland to be blotted out, though perhaps there would have been had not his home lain outside the bounds of the future lake. Relief was all that he showed, relief at the doom of the dark ancient valleys through which he had roamed all his life. They were better under water now, better under water since the strange days. And with this opening, his husky voice sank low, while his body leaned forward, and his right forefinger began to point shakily and impressively. It was then that I heard the story, and as the rambling voice scraped and whispered on, I shivered again and again despite the summer day. Often I had to recall the speaker from ramblings, piece out scientific points which he knew only by a fading parrot memory of Professor's talk, or bridge over gaps where his sense of logic and continuity broke down. When he was done, I did not wonder that his mind had snapped a trifle, or that the folk of Arkham would not speak much of the blasted heath. 
I hurried back before sunset to my hotel, unwilling to have the stars come out above me in the open, and the next day I returned to Boston to give up my position. I could not go into that dim chaos of old forest and slope again, or face another time that grey blasted heath where the black well yawned deep beside the tumbled bricks and stones. The reservoir will soon be built now, and all those elder secrets will be safe forever under watery fathoms, but even then I do not believe I would like to visit that country by night, at least not when the sinister stars are out, and nothing could bribe me to drink the new city water of Arkham. It all began, old Amy said, with the meteorite. Before that, there had been no wild legends at all since the witch trials, and even then those western woods were not feared half as much as the small island in the Miskatonic, where the devil held court beside a curious lone altar older than the Indians. These were not haunted woods, and their fantastic dusk was never terrible till the strange days. Then there had come that white noontide cloud, that string of explosions in the air, and that pillar of smoke from the valley far in the wood. And by night all Arkham had heard of the great rock that fell out of the sky and bedded itself in the ground beside the well at the Nahum Gardener place. That was the house which had stood where the blasted heath was to come, the trim white Nahum Gardener house amidst its fertile gardens and orchards. Nahum had come to town to tell people about the stone, and dropped in at Amy Pierce's on the way. Amy was forty then, and all the queer things were fixed very strongly in his mind. He and his wife had gone with the three professors from Miskatonic University, who hastened out the next morning to see the weird visitor from unknown stellar space, and had wondered why Nahum had called it so large the day before. It had shrunk, Nahum said, as he pointed out the big brownish mound above the ripped earth and charred grass near the archaic well-sweep in his front yard, but the wise men answered that stones do not shrink. Its heat lingered persistently, and Nahum declared it had glowed faintly in the night. The professors tried it with a geologist's hammer and found it was oddly soft. It was, in truth, so soft to be almost plastic, and they gouged rather than chipped a specimen to take back to the college for testing. They took it in an old pail borrowed from Nahum's kitchen, for even the small piece refused to grow cool. On the trip back, they stopped at Amy's to rest, and seemed thoughtful when Mrs. Pierce remarked that the fragment was growing smaller and burning the bottom of the pail. Truly, it was not large, but perhaps they had taken less than they thought. The day after that, all this was in June of 82, the professors had trooped out again in great excitement. As they passed Amy's, they told him what queer things the specimen had done, and how it had faded wholly away when they put it in a glass beaker. The beaker had gone too, and the wise men talked of the strange stone's affinity for silicon. It had acted quite unbelievably in that well-ordered laboratory, doing nothing at all and showing no occluded gases when heated on charcoal, being wholly negative in the borax bead and soon proving itself absolutely non-volatile at any producible temperature, including that of the oxyhydrogen blowpipe. On an anvil it appeared highly malleable, and in the dark its luminosity was very marked. Stubbornly refusing to grow cool, it soon had the college in a state of real excitement, and when upon heating before the spectroscope it displayed shining bands unlike any known colours of the normal spectrum, there was much breathless talk of new elements, bizarre optical properties, and other things which puzzled men of science are wont to say when faced with the unknown. Hot as it was, they tested it in a crucible with all the proper regents, Water did nothing. Hydrochloric acid was the same. Nitric acid and even aqua regia merely hissed and spattered against its torrid invulnerability. 
Amy had difficulty in recalling all these things, but recognised some solvents, as I mentioned them in the usual order of use. There were ammonia and caustic soda, alcohol and ether, nauseous carbon disulfide and a dozen others, but although the weight grew steadily less as time passed and the fragment seemed to be slightly cooling, there was no change in the solvents to show that they had attacked the substance at all. It was a metal, though, beyond a doubt. It was magnetic, for one thing, and after its immersion in the acid solvents, there seemed to be faint traces of the Widmanstaten figures found on meteoric rock. When the cooling had grown very considerable, the testing was carried on in glass, and it was in a glass beaker that they left all the chips made of the original fragment during the work. The next morning, both chips and beaker were gone without trace, and only a charred spot marked the place of the wooden shelf where they had left them. All this the professors told Amy as they paused at his door, and once more he went with them to see the stony messenger from the stars, though this time his wife did not accompany him. It had now most certainly shrunk, and even the sober professors could not doubt the truth of what they saw. All around the dwindling brown lump near the well was a vacant space, except where the earth had caved in, and whereas it had been a good seven feet across the day before, it was now scarcely five. It was still hot, and the sages studied its surface curiously as they detached another and larger piece with hammer and chisel. They gouged deeply this time, and as they pried away the smaller mass, they saw that the core of the thing was not quite homogeneous. They had uncovered what seemed to be the side of a large coloured globule embedded in the substance. The colour, which resembled some of the bands in the meteor's strange spectrum, was almost impossible to describe, and it was only by analogy that they called it colour at all. Its texture was glossy, and upon tapping it, it appeared to promise both brittleness and hollowness. One of the professors gave it a smart blow with a hammer, and it burst with a nervous little pop. Nothing was emitted, and all trace of the thing vanished with the puncturing. It left behind a hollow, spherical space about three inches across, and all thought it probable that others would be discovered as the enclosing substance wasted away. Conjecture was vain, so after a futile attempt to find additional globules by drilling, the seekers left again with their new specimen, which proved, however, as baffling in the laboratory as its predecessor. Aside from being almost plastic, having heat, magnetism and slight luminosity, cooling slightly in powerful acids, possessing an unknown spectrum, wasting away in air, and attacking silicon compounds with mutual destruction as a result, it presented no identifying features whatsoever. And at the end of the tests, the college scientists were forced to own that they could not place it. It was nothing of the earth, but a piece of the great outside, and as such dowered with outside properties and obedient to outside laws. That night there was a thunderstorm, and when the professors went to Nahum's the next day, they met with a bitter disappointment. The stone, magnetic as it had been, must have had some peculiar electrical property, for it had drawn the lightning, as Nahum said with a singular persistence. Six times within an hour, the farmer saw the lightning strike the furrow in the front yard, and when the storm was over... Nothing remained but a ragged pit by the ancient well-sweep, half choked with caved-in earth. Digging had borne no fruit, and the scientists verified the fact of the utter vanishment. The failure was total, so that nothing was left to do but go back to the laboratory and test again the disappearing fragment left carefully cased in lead. That fragment lasted a week, at the end of which nothing of value had been learned of it. When it had gone, no residue was left behind, and in time the professors felt scarcely sure they had indeed seen with waking eyes that cryptic vestige of the fathomless gulfs outside, that lone weird message from another universe and other realms of matter, force and entity. As was natural, the Arkham papers made much of the incident with its collegiate sponsoring, and sent reporters to talk with Nahum Gardner and his family. At least one Boston Daily also sent a scribe, and Nahum quickly became a kind of local celebrity. 
He was a lean, genial person of about fifty, living with his wife and three sons on the pleasant farmstead in the valley. He and Amy exchanged visits frequently, as did their wives, and Amy had nothing but praise for him after all these years. He seemed slightly proud of the notice his place had attracted, and talked often of the meteorite in the succeeding weeks. That July and August were hot, and Nahum worked hard at his haying in the ten-acre pasture across Chapman's Brook, his rattling wain wearing deep ruts in the shadowy lanes between. The labour tired him more than it had in other years, and he felt that age was beginning to tell on him. Then fell the time of fruit and harvest. Pears and apples slowly ripened, and Nahum vowed that his orchards were prospering as never before. The fruit was growing to phenomenal size and unwanted gloss, and in such abundance that extra barrels were ordered to handle the future crop. But with the ripening came sore disappointment, for all of that gorgeous array of specious lusciousness, not one single jot was fit to eat. Into the fine flavour of the pears and apples had crept a stealthy bitterness and sickishness, so that even the smallest bites induced a lasting disgust. It was the same with the melons and tomatoes, and Nahum sadly saw that his entire crop was lost. Quick to connect events, he declared that the meteorite had poisoned the well, and thanked heaven that most of the other crops were in the upland lot along the road. Winter came early, and it was very cold. Amy saw Nahum less often than usual, and observed that he had begun to look worried. The rest of his family, too, seemed to have grown taciturn, and were far from steady in their church-going, or their attendance at the various social events of the countryside. For this reserve or melancholy, no cause could be found, though all the household confessed now and then to poorer health and a feeling of vague disquiet. Nahum himself gave the most definite statement of anyone when he said he was disturbed about certain footprints in the snow. They were the usual winter prints of red squirrels, white rabbits and foxes, but the brooding farmer professed to see something not quite right about their nature and arrangement. He was never specific, but appeared to think that they were not as characteristic of the anatomy and habits of squirrels and rabbits and foxes as they ought to be. Amy listened without interest to this talk, until one night when he drove past Nahum's house in his sleigh on the way back from Clark's Corner. There had been a moon, and a rabbit had run across the road, and the leaps of that rabbit were longer than either Amy or his horse liked. The latter, indeed, had almost run away when brought up by a firm rain. Thereafter, Amy gave Nahum's tales more respect, and wondered why the gardener dogs seemed so cowed and quivering every morning. They had it developed, nearly lost the spirit to bark. In February, the McGregor boys from Meadow Hill were out shooting woodchucks, and not far from the gardener place bagged a very peculiar specimen. The proportions of its body seemed slightly altered in a queer way impossible to describe, while its face had taken on an expression which no one ever saw in a woodchuck's before. The boys were genuinely frightened, and threw the thing away at once so that only their grotesque tales of it ever reached the people of the countryside, but the shying of horses near Nahum's house had now become an acknowledged thing, and all the basis for a cycle of whispered legend was fast taking form. People vowed that the snow melted faster around Nahum's than it did anywhere else, and early in March there was an awed discussion in Potter's general store at Clark's Corners. Stephen Rice had driven past gardeners in the morning and noticed the skunk cabbages coming up through the mud in the woods across the road. Never were things of such size seen before, and they held strange colours that could not be put into any words. Their shapes were monstrous, and the horse had snorted at an odour which struck Stephen as wholly unprecedented. That afternoon, several persons drove past to see the abnormal growth, and all agreed that plants of that kind ought never to sprout in a healthy world. The bad fruit of the fall was being freely mentioned, and it went from mouth to mouth that there was a poison in Nahum's ground. Of course it was the meteorite, and remembering how strange the men from the college had found that stone to be, several farmers spoke about the matter to them. One day... They paid Nahum a visit, but having no love of wild tales and folklore, were very conservative in what they inferred. 
The plants were certainly odd, but all skunk cabbages are more or less odd in shape and hue. Perhaps some mineral element from the stone had entered the soil, but it would soon be washed away. And as for the footprints and frightened horses, of course this was mere country talk, which the phenomena of the aerolite would be certain to start. There was really nothing for serious men to do in cases of wild gossip, for superstitious rustics will say and believe anything. And so all through the strange days the professors stayed away in contempt. Only one of them, when given two files of dust for analysis in a police job over a year and a half later, recalled that the queer colour of that skunk cabbage had been very like one of the anomalous bands of light shown by the meteor fragment in the college spectroscope, and like the brittle globule found embedded in the stone from the abyss. The samples in this analysis case gave the same odd bands at first, though later they lost the property. The trees budded prematurely around Nahum's, and at night they swayed ominously in the wind. Nahum's second son, Thaddeus, a lad of fifteen, swore that they swayed also when there was no wind, but even the gossips would not credit this. Certainly, however, restlessness was in the air. The entire Gardner family developed the habit of stealthy listening, though not for any sound which they could consciously name. The listening was, indeed, rather a product of moments when consciousness seemed half to slip away. Unfortunately, such moments increased week by week, till it became common speech that something was wrong with all Nahum's folks. When the early saxifrage came, it had another strange colour, not quite like that of the skunk cabbage, but plainly related and equally unknown to anyone who saw it. Nahum took some blossoms to Arkham and showed them to the editor of the Gazette, but that dignitary did no more than write a humorous article about them, in which the dark fears of rustics were held up to polite ridicule. It was a mistake of Nahum's to tell a stolid city man about the way the great, overgrown, morning cloak butterflies behaved in connection with these saxifrages. April brought a kind of madness to the country folk, and began that disuse of the road past Nahum's which led to its ultimate abandonment. It was the vegetation. All the orchard trees blossomed forth in strange colours, and through the stony soil of the yard and adjacent pasturage there sprang up a bizarre growth which only a botanist could connect with the proper flora of the region. No sane, wholesome colours were anywhere to be seen except in the green grass and leafage, but everywhere were those hectic and prismatic variants of some diseased, underlying primary tone without a place among the known tints of earth. The Dutchman's breeches became a thing of sinister menace, and the bloodroots grew insolent in their chromatic perversion. Amy and the gardeners thought that most of the colours had a sort of haunting familiarity, and decided that they reminded one of the great globule in the meteor. Nahum ploughed and sowed the ten-acre pasture and the upland lot, but did nothing with the land around the house. He knew it would be of no use, and hoped that the summer's strange growths would draw all the poison from the soil. He was prepared for almost anything now, and had grown used to the sense of something near him waiting to be heard. The shunning of his house by neighbours told on him, of course, but it told on his wife more. The boys were better off being at school each day, but they could not help being frightened by the gossip. Thaddeus, an especially sensitive youth, suffered the most. In May, the insects came and Nahum's place became a nightmare of buzzing and crawling. Most of the creatures seemed not quite usual in their aspects and motions, and their nocturnal habits contradicted all former experience. The gardeners took to watching at night, watching in all directions at random for something. They could not tell what. It was then that they owned that Thaddeus had been right about the trees. Mrs. Gardner was the next to see it from the window, as she watched the swollen boughs of a maple against the moonlit sky. The boughs surely moved, and there was no wind. It must be the sap. Strangeness had come into everything growing now, yet it was none of the Nahum's family at all who made the next discovery. 
Familiarity had dulled them, and what they could not see was glimpsed by a timid windmill salesman from Bolton, who drove by one night in ignorance of the country legends. What he told in Arkham was given a short paragraph in the Gazette, and it was there that all the farmers, Nahum included, saw it first. The night had been dark, and the buggy lamps faint, but around a farm in the valley, which everyone knew from the account must be Nahum's, the darkness had been less thick. A dim though distinct luminosity seemed to inhere all the vegetation, grass, leaves and blossoms alike, while at one moment a detached piece of the phosphorescence appeared to stir furtively in the yard near the barn. The grass had so far seemed untouched, and the cows were freely pastured in the lot near the house, but toward the end of May the milk began to be bad. Then Nahum had the cows driven to the uplands, after which this trouble ceased. Not long after this, the change in grass and leaves became apparent to the eye. All the verdure was going grey, and it was developing a highly singular quality of brittleness. Amy was now the only person who ever visited the place, and his visits were becoming fewer and fewer. When school closed, the gardeners were virtually cut off from the world, and sometimes let Amy do their errands in town. They were failing curiously both physically and mentally, and no one was surprised when the news of Mrs. Gardner's madness stole around. It happened in June, about the anniversary of the meteor's fall, and the poor woman screamed about things in the air which she could not describe. In her raving there was not a single specific noun, but only verbs and pronouns. Things moved and changed and fluttered, and ears tingled to impulses which were not wholly sounds. Something was taken away. She was being drained of something. Something was fastening itself on her that ought not to be. Someone must make it keep off. Nothing was ever still in the night. The walls and windows shifted. Nahum did not send her to the county asylum, but let her wander about the house as long as she was harmless to herself and others. Even when her expression changed, he did nothing. But when the boys grew afraid of her, and Thaddeus nearly fainted at the way she made faces at him, he decided to keep her locked in the attic. By July she had ceased to speak and crawled on all fours, and before that month was over Nahum got the mad notion that she was slightly luminous in the dark, as he now clearly saw was the case with the nearby vegetation. It was a little before this that the horses had stampeded. Something had aroused them in the night, and their neighing and kicking in their stalls had been terrible. There seemed virtually nothing to do to calm them, and when Nahum opened the stable door they all bolted out like frightened woodland deer. It took a week to track all four, and when found they were seen to be quite useless and unmanageable. Something had snapped in their brains, and each one had to be shot for its own good. Nahum borrowed a horse from Amy for his haying, but found it would not approach the barn. It shied, bulked and whinnied, and in the end he could do nothing but drive it into the yard while the men used their own strength to get the heavy wagon near enough the hayloft for convenient pitching. And all the while the vegetation was turning grey and brittle. Even the flowers whose hues had been so strange were greying now, and the fruit was coming out grey and dwarfed and tasteless. The asters and golden rod bloomed grey and distorted, and the roses and zenas and hollyhocks in the front yard were such blasphemous-looking things that Nahum's oldest boy, Zenas, cut them down. The strangely puffed insects died about that time, even the bees that had left their hives and taken to the woods. By September, all the vegetation was fast crumbling to a greyish powder, and Nahum feared that the trees would die before the poison was out of the soil. His wife now had spells of terrific screaming, and he and the boys were in a constant state of nervous tension. They shunned people now, and when school opened the boys did not go. But it was Amy on one of his rare visits who first realised that the well water was no longer good. It had an evil taste that was not exactly fetid, nor exactly salty, and Amy advised his friend to dig another well on higher ground to use till the soil was good again. 
Nahum, however, ignored the warning, for he had by that time become callous to strange and unpleasant things. He and the boys continued to use the tainted supply, drinking it as listlessly and mechanically as they ate their meagre and ill-cooked meals, and did their thankless and monotonous chores through the aimless days. There was something of stolid resignation about them all, as if they walked half in another world between lines of nameless guards to a certain and familiar doom. Thaddeus went mad in September, after a visit to the well. He had gone with a pail and had come back empty-handed, shrieking and waving his arms, and sometimes lapsing into an inane titter, or a whisper about the moving colours down there. Two in one family was pretty bad, but Nahum was very brave about it. He let the boy run about for a week, until he began stumbling and hurting himself, and then he shut him in an attic room across the hall from his mother's. The way they screamed at each other from behind their locked doors was very terrible, especially to little Merwin, who fancied they talked in some terrible language that was not of earth. Merwin was getting frightfully imaginative, and his restlessness was worse after the shutting away of the brother who had been his greatest playmate. Almost at the same time, the mortality among the livestock commenced. Poultry turned greyish and died very quickly, their meat being found dry and noisome upon cutting. Hogs grew inordinately fat, then suddenly began to undergo loathsome changes which no one could explain. Their meat was, of course, useless, and Nahum was at his wit's end. No rural veterinary would approach his place, and the city veterinary from Arkham was openly baffled. The swine began growing grey and brittle, and falling to pieces before they died, and their eyes and muzzles developed singular alterations. It was very inexplicable, for they had never been fed from the tainted vegetation. Then something struck the cows. Certain areas, or sometimes the whole body, would be uncannily shriveled or compressed, and atrocious collapses or disintegrations were common. In the last stages, and death was always the result, there would be a greying and turning brittle like that which beset the hogs. There could be no question of poison, for all the cases occurred in a locked and undisturbed barn. No bites of prowling things could have brought the virus, for what live beast of earth can pass through solid obstacles? It must be only natural disease. Yet what disease could wreak such results was beyond any mind's guessing. When the harvest came, there was not an animal surviving on the place, for the stock and poultry were dead, and the dogs had run away. These dogs, three in number, had all vanished one night and were never heard of again. The five cats had left some time before, but their going was scarcely noticed since there now seemed to be no mice, and only Mrs Gardner had made pets of the graceful felines. On the 19th of October, Nahum staggered into Amy's house with hideous news. The death had come to poor Thaddeus in his attic room, and it had come in a way which could not be told. Nahum had dug a grave in the railed family plot behind the farm, and put therein what he found. There could have been nothing from outside, for the small barred window and locked door were intact, but it was much as it had been in the barn. Amy and his wife consoled the stricken man as best they could, but shuddered as they did so. Stark terror seemed to cling around the gardeners and all they touched, and the very presence of one in the house was a breath from regions unnamed and unnameable. Amy accompanied Nahum home with the greatest reluctance, and did what he might to calm the hysterical sobbing of little Merwin. Zenas needed no calming. He had come of late to do nothing but stare into space, and obey what his father told him, and Amy thought that his fate was very merciful. Now and then Merwin's screams were answered faintly from the attic, and in response to an inquiring look, Nahum said that his wife was getting very feeble. When night approached, Amy managed to get away, for not even friendship could make him stay in that spot when the faint glow of the vegetation began, and the trees may or may not have swayed without wind. It was really lucky for Amy that he was not more imaginative. Even as things were, his mind was bent over so slightly, but had he been able to connect and reflect upon all the portents around him, he must inevitably have been turned a total maniac. 
In the twilight, he hastened home, the screams of the mad woman and the nervous child ringing horribly in his ears. Three days later, Nahum burst into Amy's kitchen in the early morning, and in the absence of his host, stammered out a desperate tale once more, while Mrs. Pierce listened in a clutching fright. It was little Merlin this time. He was gone. He had gone out late at night with a lantern and pail for water, and had never come back. He'd been going to pieces for days, and hardly knew what he was about, screamed at everything. There had been a frantic shriek from the yard then, but before the farmer could get to the door, the boy was gone. There was no glow from the lantern he had taken, and of the child himself, no trace. At the time, Nahum thought the lantern and pail were gone too, but when dawn came and the man had plodded back from his all-night search of the woods and fields, he had found some very curious things near the well. There was a crushed and apparently somewhat melted mass of iron, which had certainly been the lantern, while a bent handle and twisted iron hoops beside it, both half-fused, seemed to hint at the remnants of the pail. That was all. Mrs. Pierce was blank, and Amy, when he had reached home and heard the tale, could give no guess. Merwin was gone, and there would be no use in telling the people around who shunned all gardeners now. No use either in telling the city people at Arkham who laughed at everything. Thad was gone, and now Merwin was gone. Something was creeping and creeping and waiting to be seen and heard. Nahum would go soon and he wanted Amy to look after his wife and Zenas if they survived him. It must all be a judgment of some sort, though he could not fancy what for, since he had always walked uprightly in the Lord's ways, so far as he knew. And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed part one of The Colour Out of Space by H.P. Lovecraft. If you enjoyed that, there are plenty more H.P. Lovecraft stories available on The Well Told Tale. Just check out the back catalogue via your favourite podcast player or on YouTube. If you'd like to support The Well Told Tale, the best way to do that is by visiting my Patreon page at patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. There's a link in the description. I'll be back next week with The Chilling Conclusion to the colour out of space. I hope you can join me.